Well, hello, hello. Happy Friday. It's Good Friday. Hope you're having a good day. Thank you for the folks who have decided to join us today. We're just coming on a little early. It was a, um, I wouldn't say gong show yesterday, but our 25-year-old autistic wonder had just come in from her handy bus. She goes to a day program. We'll get to Lou Graham in a second. We've got lots of great interview clips with Lou. But she came in yesterday and she was not doing well. It was uh, it was difficult being on live yesterday because she was basically yelling out loud, like yelling at the top of her lungs. So when I was on with the Lou Graham interview, which will be, by the way, in three different pieces, we put one up yesterday talking about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let me just put that down. Uh, Starry Bear, good. Hey, good evening. Well wishes. Thank you. Thanks for being the first person on. So yesterday when we were on, she was just screaming. So I'm just putting Lou Graham clips on here, left, right, and center yesterday so that you guys, I'm not, I don't know if anybody heard her screaming yesterday. That's why I came on a little early today, just before we get to the Lou Graham stuff. And a lot of good juicy clips off this one, specifically the title of the video that I think a lot of people don't know that this one song really caused a rift between the two main members of Foreigner, the two longest lasting members who were involved in the hits, I should say. Let me clarify that because now um, the the current lineup has nobody on there that, that were involved in the heyday of Foreigner. So Foreigner is touring right now with a bunch of musicians, Mick Jones, who started the band uh, many moons ago. He used to be in Spooky Tooth. and But he... Um, can't tour anymore because of health reason, reasons. And we'll get to the rock. Well, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is interesting because here's the voting. We showed this yesterday. The voting, uh, Dave Matthews is number one. Foreigner is two. Frampton is three. We're going to try to get Frampton. I'd love to talk to him. Ozzy Osbourne, then Cher. Yeah, Cher. Lenny Kravitz, cool in the gang. Uh, my neighbor, Kent, he lives right across the street from me. And he was telling me that he saw Cher and she just wasn't singing live. But I think if you go see Cher, you kind of expect that, or do you? And and Cher is, um, uh, there's, uh, hey, listen, Steve uh, Steve Howe can, can tour, and uh, Steve looks like a very old man, but he's allowed to. Uh, Cher has decided not to do that, and not to look her age, and she's got a right to do that too. But... Steve Howe still plays live as far as I know. I talked to Dylan Howe a few years ago. Talked to a lot of the guys from Yes, but never Steve Howe. Before we get going, some of your comments. Let me just grab my uh, MacBook. Um, hey, from Quebec, Bertrand Dugas. Hi, from Quebec. Bob Perry. Used to hang with these guys in the 90s. Really? That's kind of cool. A starry bear. Cher. Yeah, I know. I mean, she probably puts on an amazing show and... And uh, Kent, my neighbor, he and his wife, uh, Nicola, went to see the show. And, and they said, you know, as far as a show, it was a good show. It was like going to see Madonna in the way that it's bombastic and big. A word that I use with uh, Lou Graham in a second. Bob Perry. Oh, Mick didn't want to pay Lou. Starry Bear. If I could turn back time, I wouldn't have Cher on the list. <laughs> Cher is an entertainer, he says, yes. That's, that's very true. I mean, you got to look at it that way. I'm not sure why the comments haven't come up from yesterday's. For whatever reason, they didn't come up. So we're going to start off by basically saying, well, I said yesterday when my daughter was having a conniption fit downstairs, it was bad. Remember, if you just tuned in, she's autistic. It's not her fault. But lately, there's been a lot of shouting coming from her and she's really agitated. She's on a new medication. She has... Uh, she gets seizures and this medication is really working. This is the longest time where she hasn't had a seizure, but it really irritates the crap out of her. So some people say, oh, why didn't you come on and do an Eric Carmen obituary? I didn't because my daughter, our daughter, was having a complete meltdown and it was impossible for me to go in here. And you can't put her in the car and you just needs to shout it out or something. So anyway, this is not a poor me thing. It's to have maybe you understand that sometimes when someone dies i can't get on i just can't do it today she's having a beautiful day she's really happy 
And, and we're learning. Even though she's 25, we're still, still learning. Before we get to Lou Graham, let's talk about what we did yesterday. And a lot of folks were very happy that we broke this down yesterday. The albums that we're going to talk about are on the bottom, of course, in order. But the f- biggest selling Foreigner album is actually their first greatest hits. Remember, it had the jukebox, hence Jukebox Hero on the cover. That has sold 7.4 million copies. The second biggest, no one's surprised by this, is Foreigner 4. Uh, and Foreigner, well, the, the, the first one we should point out, uh, Foreigner, well, Foreigner 4 had four hits, uh, Urgent, Waiting for a Girl Like You, Jukebox Hero, and Break It Up. The third biggest from Foreigner, before we get to Lou Graham, is Double Vision. You know, this, we talked with Lou yesterday about the not having the sophomore jinx, and they were very aware of that. They were very scared going into Double Vision that somehow they would lose the magic or it would sound too much like the first album or any of the excuses that bands have because you have your whole life to record your first album. Even though these guys were in different bands, like I said, uh, you have your whole life to record that first album with that particular band that you're in that hits. And then you have six months or a year to record the next album. And you're scrambling, you're touring off the first album. You're probably not used to the fame. You're not used to touring that much or the press or all these things. And then all of a sudden, the second album comes up. I remember when Toto came up with their debut, I just loved it. And then I listened to the beginning of Hydra, their second album. And I remember going, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. And then going, okay, this album overall isn't as good as the first one, but it was still a great album, right? It's like Michael Jackson thriller and then bad. And you go, to me, bad was bad, but it's a long story. We're, we're, we're going off topic. Okay, so the 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 second album is their third biggest selling album of all time, Double Vision, which had Hot Blooded, the title song, and Blue Morning, Blue Day, which is one of my favorite Foreigner songs. Foreigner, uh, the fourth biggest is uh, their debut album, 1977, 5.2 million. I should point out that Double Vision sold 7.2 million. Then Head Games from 79, Love Head Games. I just love that album. It's very heavy. Five singles, two hits, Dirty White Boy and Head Games and Agent Provocateur, which came out in 84, which is 4.1 million, which I want to know what love is, is on it. And that was yesterday. And that is our topic today. Let's get to some Lou Graham uh, clips. I'll get to the members in a second as far as what Lou said for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He didn't tell me this because this interview is before they were nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But Lou said to a, I think a radio station not that long ago, that from his understanding, if they get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they the as much of the original members will be on stage. And that's what he's been told. So he, he thought they were going to play I Want to Know What Love Is and Jukebox Hero. So I don't know if, I'm sure he's talked to Mick Jones. We talk about his relationship with Mick Jones at the time, quite a few months ago, when I interviewed him for this, when I talked to him for this interview. So let's get to some of the clips. Lou Graham, he seems very comfortable as he's sitting in his big chair. You'll notice the Beatles uh, picture from Ed Sullivan, which I mentioned in this interview from 64. Uh, I'm not sure where my light's going crazy. Um, This is about when Foreigner broke. Lou Graham on Rock History Music. Let me start with, I know your, 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 your family was musical, but uh, I'll skip ahead and we'll go back in a second. But when things broke for you, when things got like bombastic and big and foreigner and everything was going on, how did your friends and how did your family react? I mean, they must have been incredibly proud. I think stunned and proud would, would be more appropriate. Yeah, you know, they, they, they I, I had no idea what what success tasted like or or moving into that other league, you know, the, the real big time league. Uh, I was in a band before Foreigner called Black Sheep. Yep. And we had two albums on Capitol Records and we were touring with uh, 10 Years After and and Kiss. And, and we got a taste, a small taste of it. But then our our truck slid off the highway and rolled over. The equipment was destroyed. That was the end of our tour and ultimately the end of our record contract with Capitol Records. Don Mancuso, so, so, by the way, last week told me, Don Mancuso was, t- man, that guy speaks highly of you. Sorry to interrupt you, but he. He's, he's a good man. Very he's, good man. I, I mean, talk about, you've had a lot of long-term, I mean, that says something. You don't always get that music. You've had a lot of long-term relationships with people. Yes, I do. When I make friends, I keep friends. 
and and he, Don mentioned, he says, he says, uh, Lou is loyal. Lou has a, a, he says, that's a software not everyone has, especially in this industry when money gets involved. But he said, you're just, he's a loyal man. That's a, it's a great thing to hear about someone. Yeah, it really is. And I appreciate those comments. You, you know, when, when uh, a- after our truck crash, we were dropped by Capitol Records. We couldn't, we couldn't fulfill our obligation for the KISS tour. So when that ended, then we were dropped by Capitol Records, and and uh, we were in li- Black Sheep was in limbo, and that's about the time I got a call from Mick, who who had been playing with Leslie West, left Leslie, was in the midst of starting his own band yet unnamed. Uh, uh, he was in Mick was in Rochester maybe six or eight months earlier, uh, with with Spooky Tooth. Did, were I, you familiar and, with them by the way at that time? Where you, you must have known Spooky Tooth, eh? Uh, I was a big Spooky Tooth fan. They were great, and and, and uh, so we got we got backstage to to meet them, and I gave Mick the two Black Sheep albums. I says, here, I says you can give those a listen at your leisure. So so apparently he did because he when he was, began forming this yet unnamed band, he remembered hearing my voice on those records and ended up calling my parents. And, and asking them if they could get in touch with me and if I could call him back. So so I did, and he said, would you like to come to New York and audition for this new band I'm putting together? And, and, and while it sounded very intriguing, I said, you know what, Mick, I says, I appreciate the offer. I says, but but I'm in a band. I said, I'm in a very good band. We just had a, had a run of, of bad luck. And I told him what happened. And he said, oh, that's really bad, you know? He says, well, listen, he goes, he goes, I know you're going to see if you could put things back together. I'll call you back in about three weeks and we'll talk again. So in the meantime, I told the guys from Black Sheep who called and wanted me to audition. And they said, what are you, crazy? Go to New York. See see what you can do, you know? So when Mick called back, I says, yeah, I'm ready to come to audition. You know, when, De- when Don told me that, I remember going, it's kind of like a Linda Ronstadt Eagles story when she said to them, you know, and that I always say hard times makes good people when you see that situation. But your chance is bigger than what was going on there. They saw it. They they. And by the way, paying your due sounds like a foreigner song. I, I remember. That's people, <laughs> I think it does. I listen to that. I listen to your voice. I'm going when he heard those when Mick heard that. I, I'm sure he is. I mean, I'm not going to put words in Mick Jones uh, 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 situation, but paying your dues to me. I'm going that's that sounds like early foreigner to me. Yes, it does, doesn't it? That's great, so, so, great so driving fun. song. So, so I, I flew to New York. He sent me a ticket, and and uh, I, I uh, stayed at a hotel, and, and right around the corner from where the band rehearsed, I auditioned. Uh, uh, they liked my voice. They didn't tell me I was in, but Mick asked me if I could stay for a few days. I went down there with a satchel. I had two T-shirts, two pairs of underwear, and two pairs of socks, and that was it. So I stayed there over a week, and at night I'd come, I'd come back to my hotel, and I'd <coughs> wa- hand wash my clothes, and, <coughs> you know, so I'd have clean clothes to wear the next day. Yeah. A- a- and finally, I told him, "Look, I says, I says, I came down here expecting to stay a day or two. I says, I've been here over a week. I said, I have no clothes. I says, I've got to go home. If you want me to come back and 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 uh, participate, I says, I'm I'm more than willing." I says, I, I said, I haven't even been told if I'm in yet. And, and he goes, oh, yeah, you're in, you're in, you know. So then I started getting a stipend from, from management, from foreigners management, so I could, so I could fly home. And they, they, gave, they didn't give me a lot of money, but they gave me enough money to, to put my furniture in a trailer. I, I, I had, a, had a, 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 a young girl with me who I've been living with for three years already, so... We all went down, and we didn't. We couldn't stay in New York City. You couldn't. You couldn't afford to stay in New York City at that time, and now either. So we, we were about <coughs> north of New York in a place called uh, 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 Croton on Hudson. It was right on the Hudson River, and there was a, a train line that went direct from the Croton Station right to Grand Central Station. So 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 I, I you know we, we got a place for for about one hundred twenty five dollars a month. Which was which was at the top of our rent level at that point, 
and uh, we moved in with the little furniture we had, and we started shopping at at uh, 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 secondhand stores for a little <clears throat> more furniture and this and that. And and we 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 got uh, we called that home for for over a year. And I was either taking a train or driving into Manhattan every time the band rehearsed. Let's get to the title of our video. I don't usually wait 15 minutes to get to the point. Um, I do like when, when streamers do that for whatever reason, because I like the story of it and finding out different things. And when I come on live, it's less structured, of course, because that's just the way it is. Um, before we talk about the song that broke up the band, which most of you know, there's uh, some homework we should do. Like Ian McDonald will not be there because he died in 2022 uh, at 75 years old as far as if they get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, he was in King Crimson, a multi-instrumentalist. He was uh, on Foreigner's first three albums, Foreigner, Double Vision, and Head Games. And I remember my impression of him was always, oh, he's the good-looking guy in the band. He's quite a handsome fella. And then Al Greenwood, he was he's 72. He might be there. He was on the first three Foreigner albums. And uh, let's see what else we got here. Oops. Uh, Ed uh, Gaglardi, he died in 2014. He was 62. He was uh, on the first two albums. Then we've got Dennis Elliott. He was on the first seven albums. He's 73. I'm sure he'll be at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I certainly hope he will. And then uh, Rick Wills joined on Head Games. Um, he was uh, the third. He was on the third. Head Games their third album. He's 76. My computer's completely glitching out on me here. He was in the Small Faces, Roxy Music, Peter Frampton, Spooky Tooth, David Gilmore, Bad Company, and uh, un unbelievable, unbelievable musician in general. But let's get to our thing. Their only number one song was, was I Want to Know What Love Is. Now, there's nothing wrong with a band like Foreigner having... Uh, a slow song. I mean, rock ballads were everywhere in the 80s. I was getting into radio at the time. I remember I saw them in concert just before that, a couple of albums before that with the, the Head Games Rock Circus, which I'm sure Dwayne uh, from Edmonton might have, I think we've talked about this already. I think he's, yeah, I think Dwayne, you were probably at Rock Circus when Foreigner played. And it was the Head Games tour. I remember it was quite exciting. But let's get to the song I Want to Know What Love Is, which... When Lou tells the story, it's kind of heartbreaking. And remember, to be clear, this is Lou Graham, nothing against Lou's perspective, but this is his side of the story. Before I put this on, I have nothing against Mick Jones. Uh, when someone tells you something, you say, okay, thank you. But we are hearing one side of the story. It's Lou Graham's side. No disrespect on either way, but sometimes for a perspective, it's important to sort of look at that. Let's listen to Lou Graham talk about uh, how one song kind of kind of ruined things. I want to know what love is. You were a big part of the writing of that song. Uh, how did that go down? Um, Mick had a when I I I, I, had, I, I moved from. From, from Croton on Hudson to a place called Katona, which was a sweet little town. Well, it was a city actually, but it was very small. And, and uh, I had a nice house with, with a couple, two acres. And, and uh, it, it was just a beautiful place to live. And Mick bought a house in Bedford Hills, which was an exclusive, exclusive part of the area. And his home was uh, two, three million dollars. It had uh, fifteen acres. It had had uh, 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 eight bedrooms, and you know, as as nice as my house was, he made my place look like a shack. Okay, a and so he would go up. He and his family would go up there for weekends. You know, he spent the week in the city, and on the weekends he would he would go north to bed to bedford hills and, and stay at his mansion and that's where he and i would work it would take me less than 10 minutes to drive from my house to his house in bedford hills and and, and just like the old days i would arrive there around dinner time i'd have dinner with him and we'd immediately go into a little tiny room with, with 
his equipment and his tape machines and stuff and a mic for myself and we would work on song ideas and that's that's where he he played me the intro to I want to know what love is and, and on, on a cassette player and and uh, after the intro he started playing the chords of the verse and, and I could hear in the background him humming a little little melody you know and and he goes don't pay any attention to that he goes I just I was just fooling around but, but I liked what he had put down you know and we we started to work on the song and, and he had the big he had the vision for the song you know because it was his idea but but I was contributing phrase phrases and some some lyrical lines and, and some arrangement lines but the big thing is when we went into the studio to record it uh, a friend of his uh, a, a, a really cool black gentleman came in and said that he was working at an all black uh, gospel label and he listened to to what we had recorded so far and he says that song needs needs a gospel choir he says it's beyond a ballad it, it's it's ethereal it, it it's it, it has it has uh, uh, gospel overtones all over it and, and we had we hadn't even been thought about that so so he says i've got a gospel choir from new jersey on my label he says i'd like to send them over here and and you work on some parts with them and and just let them sing you know and um so so, so while mick was in one studio, you know, a, a, a studio complex has usually two or three studios within it. So he was in one studio working with the choir. Okay, I was in another studio with with another engineer singing the song by myself. Usually, when I sing a song, mix in there. He's always noodling with my melodies or my nuances. No, try this, Lou. Try this. Try that. You know. And and I was just singing my heart. Ask anything, just leave me alone. Let me sing, and I did. And the 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 recording that you hear on that song, I did that by myself, just me and an engineer. And when I came back and played it for Mick, he he was like, "Oh, that's nice." And then he went back to working with the choir, you know. And and uh, he, he never even really really paid much attention to it because he was consumed with making sure the choir was right. And 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 at, at that point, I helped him with it. But but quietly, that that lead vocal part with all the ad libs and everything uh, uh, became became the 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 crux of what that song was built on, including the ad libs from the choir at the end and everything like that. That, that was all based around the vocal that, that, that I had accomplished by myself with, with no input from anybody. And, and I, I thought that that was a big accomplishment for me because I usually can't sing two notes without him uh, uh, adjusting something or try this, try that, try this, try that, you know? And uh, interesting and exciting experience to be left alone, mm -hmm. my own devices to sing a monumental song. And uh, so the song was complete, and and it, it sounded fantastic. And usually towards the end of an album when when most of the, when all the songs are recorded Mick and I would go into uh, an office or something like that and and we would take little post-it notes and write down each song and what we thought our share of the song writing should be now we've been doing this since the first album and and usually we're we're very close you know 
he might say we had a, a lot of 50 50 split songs right a lot of them but sometimes uh, you know i i would feel that he contributed more than me and i would put down mix 60 lou 40 and and a lot of times he would have the same thing down you know and and we never had we never had if, if our thoughts were different we would always split it down the middle and and be happy you know mm-hmm. because we were so 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 thrilled with our songwriting accomplishments that we had a very potent team. But I want to know what love is. When we first wrote wrote on, on the post that knows what we thought it should be, I had 60 Mick, 40 Lou. He had 80 Mick, 20 Lou. Um, so then I I I so then we scratch that off and we do it again. And I had 70 Mick, 30 Lou. You know what he had? 95 Mick, 5 Lou. Okay. I, I don't know why, why he, it was, it was like he wanted us to cut my throat or something. I, I, just, I don't know where 95, 5 came from. The song was going to be a massive hit. It turned out way past our expectations I had a, I had what I feel is a landmark vocal on it for him that he didn't even have to be a part of, you know. Your biggest song. Yes, and and, and so it went from you know 70, 75, 25 to 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 ninety five five, and and I, I was looking at him. It was very hurtful. I says, I says really. I said I says what's prompting you to to do this he goes i'm thinking about it and that's what i think you had said before that it was the beginning of the end for you eh? yes it was and and i had feel i felt totally betrayed and i says mick i says why why are you even bothering with the file i says i know you want the whole thing just take the whole thing mick it'll have just your name on it you know the way you like it and and that was the end of that and he took the whole thing. And, and, and with that song, he made he upped his publishing deal another three million. Okay. Because that song was so big. His publishing me- deal was substantial, you know, c- compared to mine. Uh, uh, mine was very modest. And after he he had a hundred percent of I Wanna Know What Love Is, that was a number one song around the world. Mm-hmm. his publishing deal went up $3 million plus the royalties he was getting in a hundred percent of the royalties. And, and I felt ultimately uh, uh, betrayed and, and, and uh, manipulated. And that, that, that what he did to me was an act of greed, a hundred percent greed. And that he wanted all of the, the credit for that song. And that's exactly what he got. It was number one around the world. People were piling accolades on him. It won him a Grammy. I mean, I sang the song. I never got a Grammy. Grammy went to Mick. I said, don't I get one too? I says, I sang the song. Does that count for anything? Apparently not. What's your relationship uh, with him now? Well, I'll, I'll get to that. So, so that that threw a wrench in in the relationship. The tour was was okay, but 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 there was no camaraderie. You know, I I I I didn't feel any camaraderie from him. Him, he he was uh, the guy that stabbed me in the back. You know, so we performed and we pretended on stage, but but off stage we we kept our distance. There was no, there was no writing new songs in the back room. There, there was no playing euchre until three in the morning. There was none of that. You know, we were bandmates, but but by contract only. And uh, when it came time to do the next album, he played me four songs that were complete. Lyrics, 
uh, uh, music, melody, and arrangement. And, and he said to me, he says, listen to what I sang. He says, and do it verbatim like that. Melody, words, everything. He says, he says, you don't even have to think about it. Just do it. So that those songs were his 100%. I was only a little piece, just the voice, just the voice of the song, you know, nothing important. And, and uh, so, so after that beginning to the, to the album, when it came time to, when there was room for me to, to contribute, I didn't. Mm -hmm. At that point, I didn't want anything to do with the album. Kind of like it's kind but, of like it takes your heart out of it almost. Yes, it does. And 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 you know what the first song on that album that 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 was written and that the band recorded? I don't want to live without you. A ballad. So there were some pretty good rock songs on there, you know. And towards the end, I did contribute a little bit. But the first single was That Was Yesterday, which is a good song. Mm -hmm. Second single was I Don't Want to Live Without You. I think number one around the world again. And again, accolades for being such a great songwriter. And the money was pouring in for him. And, and at that time, I, I, at the end of that, I was, I was, I was really, really uh, bitter and, and, uh, I, I honestly didn't want anything to do with him because because I felt he was not not only betraying me, but but purposely cutting me out from the inner circle. You know that that he used me to a point, and and then after he made a huge hit on his own with I want to know what love is that he was going to do it again with I don't want to live without you. And he did do it again. And I had nothing to do with that song. And, and, and you know what? I didn't even sing that song the best way I could. I, I did a, a very slight imitation of Dean Martin. I sang that song like, I don't want to live without you. And, you know, it, it, it was, it was a, it was a put on. It wasn't really Lou Graham singing. It, it was it was Lou Graham pretending I was Frank or Tony, you know. Yeah, but and, you still did a really good job. It was it was a good job, but but if you listen closely, it it, it was mimicked a little bit, you know, and, and and he never caught it, but I knew what I knew what I was doing, you know, and and, and after that happened and it went number one, I I I, I think. I think the the album after that, the, the uh, I had I had very few contributions, and, and and I wouldn't even I wouldn't even tour to support that album. I quit the band. Mm -hmm. That'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah, but you came back. Um... Well, he 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 and his wife. After that, he and his wife. And I think his his two younger kids went on an ocean tour that that went around the world. I think he was on tour uh, uh, on the liner for five and a half or six months, you know, with various stops at different cities and retooling and refueling and all new new stuff that they brought on for food and stuff. It was a, it was a real real uh, uh, ocean going vessel that that that. You know, you, when when you when you think of being a, being on one of those ships, you think a week or ten days, and and they dock and you fly home. He was gone a long time. In the time that he was gone, I wrote and recorded my first solo album with, with my own players. I'm going to talk about some of the uh, solo stuff in a second, and Mick Jones's reaction to. Uh, Lou Graham deciding to go out on his own. And the fact that Midnight Blue was presented to Foreigner, to Mick Jones, as a possible single song 
Um, I mean, I, I'm sure it would have been considered a, the, uh, a hit or a, a single rather, but it, uh, yeah, they, he, they turned it down. Foreigner turned it down. Midnight Blue. Midnight Blue to me is probably if you combine the solo stuff from Lou and Foreigner, it's probably my favorite song. There's just something about that that song the, the the lyrics in that song and sorry about the coughing for whatever reason i updated and i am catching a cold i updated my software for ecamm which is what we use and i updated it and for whatever reason when when a video comes on it's supposed to mute the microphone automatically it's supposed to just be muted and and here I am, I'm clearing my throat, <laughs> I have no idea. And I haven't checked the comments for a while because I'm going to the bathroom, I'm hacking. Anyway, we've got more Lou Graham coming up. I hope the band Foreigner will get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They certainly have deserved to be there for quite a few years. Um, I mean, we all remember, you know, loving this band in the 70s. I mean, the late 70s when they came out, I couldn't believe how how... Like in 77, I was 17 years old and I couldn't believe how gritty they were and just a great band. And Mick sang a few songs, Mick Jones, but the the foreigner that I loved was Mick Jones's guitar and Lou Graham singing. And I'm that that's just where I was at 17 years old. That, that's kind of a cool thing. We have some more clips from Lou. We're going to do this again tomorrow and I'll make sure my microphone is muted some guy said, came on here, hey, aren't you a radio guy? Don't you know? Okay. Wasn't necessary, but that's okay. Uh, I should have I should have checked that. Um, what are we going to now? We're going to go to clip two. Uh, Mick Jones, the Beatles, and uh, sort of the beginning of, of the band a little bit more. I, I noticed a picture behind you, that famous, uh, that famous appearance in 64 in the Ed Sullivan show, but... Well, I, I'd heard you in another interview saying, so Mick knew some of the Beatles? Yeah, well, in 1961 or 62, when, when the Beatles were playing in uh, Munich and Hamburg, yeah. uh, uh, he, he, was, he was playing with, with uh, the French Elvis, um, uh, his name escapes me now, but he was, he was very popular. Johnny Holiday, Johnny Holiday. And they crossed paths a bunch of times, and the Beatles were so surprised to see an English guy in with a French band that they asked them to jam on stage. And after the show, they all hung out all night and stuff like. That. He was he was one of them for over a week. He said he says it felt like I was one of them. That's insane. Yes, uh, I mean, there's a uh, uh, is is this your place or is this Bob's place that you're at? This is my place. Okay, so that that is your picture and. Yes, it is. I have a um, number of pictures like that. Is that right? Did you ever? Um, I have pictures with the Beatles laying on the canvas and Muhammad Ali standing over them like this. Man, God. it's like a crap show today. This is a crap show today. Anyway, we're going to talk about, I'm going to have to edit this after. This is ridiculous, but I am catching a cold. That's my excuse and I'm sticking with it. Um, 404 is the album that Fairweather music fans from Foreigner decided that, okay, I'll give this band a chance. Because it's, it is their biggest selling studio album at seven, seven plus million. Lou Graham talking about that. Um, God, I got to get my stuff together here with the with this recording today. Let's see what happens when I don't have Shannon on with me. 
when four came out, the band got smaller. Um, someone had asked me to, t- to ask you, he said that you regretted that, that, uh, that, 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 that happened. I regretted it for the friendships that we had, yeah. but, but, but I not only agreed, but I, I, uh, uh, kind of pushed for it to happen musically. Uh, you know, the first, the first three albums were, were, were fine, but, but I was seeing a sameness a sameness in people's playing no matter what what song we were writing or recording it was almost like they were playing the same similar parts all the time same similar sound there was nothing nothing creative or nothing that made us go wow that's great you know they were just just kind of like noodling and uh, it, it 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 wasn't it wasn't uh helping the band get any better they they were it, it was just a, it was just not a good feeling, you know. Well, it was, and it's six times platinum and had five singles. <laughs> oh no, I understand. I understand all that, and so did Mick. You know, and he felt the same way. Uh, we 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 were at a point after Head Games where we needed a big album, a creatively different album in a different direction, and we started writing songs for it. And, and these particular guys were, were into it, but but. They were playing the same stuff they played two albums ago, you know, just noodling, same sounds, same kind of, they, they were, we were growing and we needed to grow and they were not growing. They were actually holding us back. So Graham talking about his time with Foreigner and how different stages of the band did not suit him that well. Um, we're going to talk about him going solo now and Mick Jones's reaction to to how that kind of went down. When he went solo, I remember thinking, wow, my first thought, and I was wrong in thinking that, that, that he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't really need Foreigner. Uh, but with all that behind him and Foreigner, of course, it was a big part of his life. So um, Lou Graham talking about uh, going solo. How did Mick react to, did he ever talk to you about the first, your, your first album? Did he ever? He, he, was, he was very angry. Very angry that I, I wrote songs and recorded an album and released it on Atlantic and held him and the rest of the band up from releasing the next four album. Basically, they had to wait when my album was released another three or four months until it started to die down mm-hmm. be, be, before, because I, I was touring to support that album. You know, he says, he says, we're ready to go here, Lou. We, we want to write songs. We want to get ready to record our next album. I said, Mick, I says, I've learned a lot from you over the years. And if there's one thing I remember that I've learned is when you put out an album, you go on the road and support that album or don't even bother making albums. I said, so I'm doing what I learned from you. And when I'm done, I'll be ready to record. And that's what happened. Jeez. Well, how did the ending come? How did the that ultimate ending happen? The ending came after I recorded Long Hard Look. Mm-hmm. And, and promoted it with a short tour. I told Mick that, that, that I didn't want to be part of the band anymore. What did he say? He, sa- he says, I've known that for a while, he said. Really? Yeah, he says, and that's okay. We've got a singer already. That's what he told me. Was that Kelly? Johnny Edwards. Oh, so I, I, I'm not familiar with him. Uh, Inside Information. Oh, Realm Inside Information. Yeah, yeah. A- and they had an album out in, in two or three months, and it completely panned. I don't think it even made it to the top 100 on the album charts. It may have been in the in the 80s for a couple of weeks, and then fell off. No hit singles, no no album charts. I think they went out and toured on it, but 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 I think it was mostly because of the old hits that that they got anybody at all in their audience. What did that tell you? We know what it told you. It it confirmed what I'd hoped and and that was that he was not the only talent in the band and and that after 
15 years or so, I don't have to follow him like a puppy dog. I can do what I want to do. And it's, it's, it's infectious quality music. Yeah. Lou Graham on Rocky Street Music. It's John Bowden. Uh, one of the things we're going to start doing is <laughs> maybe with less technical problems. One of the things we're going to start doing is try to come on every day with a new interview. This is an interview we presented before, not in its entirety. This is there's some things in this interview that we haven't presented before. Uh, it's kind of unedited in that way. But sometimes there's a lot of off the record stuff in interviews that we can't present. Uh, we have this deal with our son Chase, who's in his own band. That's the band that I put up with Karma Charm the other day because I needed to put it up uh, to present it on the big screen TV to my in laws. They wanted to see it and I didn't know how to put it on the big screen TV. So I thought it's a private video. I'll have to make it unprivate for about half an hour. Anyway, uh, so he's in his own band. But we tell Chase uh, one thing, which is when you sell, when I'm finished with all these interviews and there's thousands, literally, and we'll get to Lou Graham and uh, his current relationship with Mick Jones in a second. When I'm done with these interviews, one of the things that I have to do is tell him to to sell the chopped up interviews, not the, the the whole interviews, because there's so much off the record stuff where sometimes musicians tell me things that they don't want the rest of the world to know. Um, and they just go, by the way, this is off the record and they'll give me some juicy thing. And you have to have integrity when you're doing this sort of thing. You cannot let the cat out of the bag. That's not meant to see the light of day. Sometimes when I'm talking to an old friend or having a few beers, that kind of stuff will come out if I can trust the person. Uh, but but that's kind of it. You know what I mean? So Lou Graham, his, and remember, this is Lou's point of view. It's very important. And I don't say this enough in these interviews. It should go without saying, but this is one side of the story. And this is nothing against Lou Graham, but it should be pointed out when you're telling something that's kind of sharp and kind of juicy that there's two sides to every story, right? Or as some people say, there's his side, his side, and then the truth. I kind of like that saying in some ways and other ways I don't like it. But anyway, we're up to this. We've got three more clips to go. And remember, this is a few months old. So I'm sure he's talked to Mick Jones about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame if they get in. Uh, what's the relationship with Mick now like? And by the way, what do you think of Kelly, their singer? Two questions. Uh, Kelly is all right. He's a good singer. But, but, but I think Mick really told Kelly when he first got in the band that he had to study me because he sings those songs with the same musical innuendos and, and vocal licks and ad libs as I have. He, he's, he's mimicking me. He, his voice doesn't sound like me, but, but he's singing the song the, the way I would sing them, you know, and, and I don't, you know, some people say, well, take it as a compliment, Lou. I don't take it as a compliment. You know, you're a singer with a big band like that. Use your voice and your style. Don't, don't hang your coat on my hook. Yeah, but do you think the, fa the fans would accept that? that, that uh, um, or do you have more faith in the fans that maybe they want? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think he should sing the songs verbatim like me. You know, maybe sing a couple parts but, but let his own influences show, show the fans that he's the new singer. No, not me. What was it like? Uh, what was it like when you were sharing the stage with him, when you came back for those select shows? It, it, it was okay. He, he, he was bouncing off the walls. You know, he, he, he couldn't stand still or sit still. Uh, I couldn't get on after a song ended. I couldn't even get in a word to thank the audience or tell them that I was happy to be part of the reunion at the end of the song, the last note hit, and, and there wasn't a quarter of a second of space before he was yapping away to the audience. Hey, it was like, geez, will you quiet down for a minute? So is that over now? Is that over now for you and Forner? I think so, yeah. I don't want to be part of it. Well, you know, Ian has passed away, and, and Ed Gagliardi passed away, even though he wasn't part of the reunions. Two original members of, of the six are, have now gone. Yeah. 
and Mick is in very poor health. I think when for, when the new foreigner plays, I've heard that he comes on for one song and then waves and goes off stage. Yeah, I'd heard he wasn't there for the whole thing. I didn't I didn't know it was one song. I but uh, yeah, it, it was. It, he would play the whole last half of the set. But but then he was in the hospital again for weeks. He, he had some some heart problems. And and his recovery time was was very long and tedious. And, and I've heard that he comes on for one song now. When he comes on, most of the time, Foreigner has no original Foreigner members in it. Two more clips. Not four, two more clips. And we'll present another six, seven tomorrow. It was a long interview. It was almost two hours, if I remember correctly. I, yesterday, I thought it was an hour and a half. But when we took out some stuff, told me some juicy off the record stuff, Um uh, he's a very personable guy. You know, uh, someone had once said when we first presented some of it that they said, oh, he's malcontent. If he's saying what he's, if what he's saying is true, and again, there's two sides to every story. I might be in sort of a, not a happy state if that happened to me. If, you know, because Mick has his point of view, I've reached out to, to Mick before even I reached out to Lou Graham. But we heard nothing, and maybe he's just not doing any interviews anymore. Lou Graham has gone through his own things and uh, medical things, some of which has uh, even altered the way he looks. Some of that's age. Uh, but he had uh, some medical dealings, and we're going to talk about that. Really, it's how he's still alive. Why do you think, and I know you watched 2020, and I know you saw the doctor talking about the tumor uh, in your head and he's you were told that it was not operable you watched that show you went to visit him uh some some of the fans had said you know he should be dead a lot of rockers should be dead and they're not but but here you are uh you know i know it was a long recovery for you you had to like write some of the lyrics down and stuff but why do you think you're still here because this is what I was meant to do. You know, I mean, I was 40, 47 years old when, when, when I went under the knife for that tumor. A and my doctor told me, he says, he says, this was a very fragile uh, uh, operation. He says, he says, I know what you do for a living. He says, and, and I think that's fantastic. He says, but you shouldn't be doing any of that for at least a year and a half until we see how things settle in your brain and your brain, you know, builds up some kind of uh, strength and resistance to, to what you're going to put that brain through with the volume. And you went back I fast. Told, you went I back. was told, I was told by management that they canceled shows when I had to go in for my operation and, and, while I was in the hospital, they rescheduled the shows and they, they couldn't cancel them again or we'd be up for lawsuits. So I wasn't out of the hospital two weeks and I was flying to Japan. And I had all the words to all the songs written with a marker and taped in a semicircle in front of me. Because I, I usually could start the song off fine, but by the second verse, I didn't know what I was going to say. Well, what and condition had, were you in? What condition were you in after a show? Did you just like... Yes. And a lot of times after a show, we would get on the bus. And I had the back lounge while, while they were... You, you know, I was also... I, I had been clean and sober for about six or seven years and nobody else in that band was and and so i had the back lounge to myself a small back lounge tv you know i have some snacks and, and, a, and a, some soft drinks or something but when i had to go use the restroom i came out of that lounge and and they were playing euchre just like i used to with them uh, uh and, and uh as I was 
heading to, towards the restroom, I'd see everybody going, come on, quick, you know, and, and I, I'd use the restroom. And when I'd come out, they, one or two of them would stand up and throw their arms around me and, and tell me that, that they're so happy that I pulled through the operation and I was okay to play, but I really wasn't. Yeah. And, 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 and then, and then they said, and we're so glad you're clean and sober. We were really worried about you. And I, and I looked on a table and I see the lines and the Stoli bottles and everything. Uh, and I kind of rolled my eyes up to the back of my head and I said, thanks so much for that. And walked back to my, my little room. Wow. Oh, by so, the way, so I, I was isolated and, and because I was clean and sober, ostracized. For of all that, things, that Being tour was so. a, was a tour for, for from hell for me. Yeah, it was horrible. Tour from hell, I'm sure. Uh, well, I've been told that from a lot of musicians throughout the years, where they were at the maybe a latter incarnation of the band where it didn't go well. Uh, Miles Goodman had told my cohort Steve Burgess, who gave me he's the gentleman who gave me all those interviews, and he's going to be on this channel talking about his new book. Uh, we're also going to talk about his history in radio and some of his interview um, memories. But he has a brand new book coming out. So I'm going to interview him considering he's so connected to this channel because we've used some of his interviews. But he, Miles Goodwin told him that of April Wine that their last like real tour before he went solo with his first album in I think 87, 88 was hell. He said, I'd rather go to the dentist every day than go through that again. And it's just stories that come up in rock and roll a lot. Now, before, um, here it is, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's the voting. Uh, why not cover my face? Why not? Dave Matthews Band is number one. This is a, as of yesterday, by the way. Foreigners, number two in voting. Peter Frampton, number three. Ozzy, Cher, Lenny Kravitz, Cool and the Gang, Mariah Carey, Oasis, uh, Sinead O'Connor. Oasis, of course, have, have come forward and said that they, they, they don't give a crap about that. Ian Anderson has told me, we're going to present, by the way, I've got a maybe one more clip coming up, both the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Ian Anderson had told me he doesn't really care about it. He, um, It's weird that Jethro Tull is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I mean, considering how many albums they've got, but it's got nothing to do with how many. It's the quality of the albums that they've released and how they affected, how they inspired other musicians, right? So one more clip. Um I want to thank all the folks who came on with us. We're not quite finished yet. I'll come on after this clip. But this is, by the way, Lou has spoken out about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since he talked to me, of course. And he has said, as far as he knows, the original band, of course, two of the two of the, the members can't uh, perform because they're no longer with us. And Mick Jones might not be able to go on stage because of all his problems, his medical problems, the guitarist for and the leader of foreigner but lou graham has been told he says that this many of the original members will go on and perform jukebox hero he thinks and i want to know what love is so i don't know if that's going to be the case but he recently said that now this is before they got nominated and i asked uh lou graham if he would go on stage and we played this clip yesterday but it's it's uh it's worth playing again is what he said rock and roll hall of fame if uh, would you go I, 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 I think I would go, but, but, but I, 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 cause you know, they want you to go. I mean, the fans I, would, want no, you I don't go. know that. I don't know that they've never said that to me. Uh, uh, for some reason there there's bad blood with foreigners, old management and Mick because, because apparently Mick and our, and our, and our old manager didn't th thought that we should have been in the hall of fame when, when they had all our peers in and we're now moved on to another generation of rockers and they completely ignored us. So, so Mick and our manager went in there and apparently had a big blowout with, with the, the head of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and, and a couple of the, the executives there. And it ended up that they told Mick and our manager, I don't care what you've done, I don't care what you do, it'll be a cold day in hell when you'll be in the Rock Hall of Fame. That's what that's what they, that's what they accomplished. Okay. 
Wow. And, and Mick was close friends with what's the guy from Rolling Stone? Uh, Jan Werner. Or Werner. Or... Yeah, they were they were close friends. Their wives were close friends. They were always out dinner and a bar or going to a live rock show or something. They, they were inseparable. After that little to do, they haven't spoken since. And that that had to be about 14, 15 years ago. Our last clip of today's show will have seven, I think, maybe eight more clips coming up tomorrow. Uh, it's a thing that we're going to start doing more often, mainly because it's a great way for me to talk to you and Shannon will be on. It's a lot easier when Shannon's here. Um, when we're, you know, I'm reading comments and we're, we're going forward. Let me just read some of the comments from you right now before we leave. Um, XOXO Bob, your fans don't care about bad blood though. You deserve your accolades. Bertrand says, Abba was in a rock and roll hall of fame before Rush. It's a joke. Fraser J. Um, wrote, as a fellow Brit, no, shocking band, awful. Uh, I'm reading these backwards, so I'm not sure what people are saying. Oh, uh, uh, Fraser J says, John Shirts the take center stage. Notice I, I'm not wearing, this is an interview quite a few months ago, but someone was asking me, when I go downstairs and I'm in the studio, it's in our basement, when I'll, I have all that stuff in the background, when I do a lot of interviews, when I do those interviews, I'm wearing black. Someone says, why don't you wear your colorful shirts? And, and, and I'll say it again. I can't wear a colorful shirt where I have so much behind me. It's just overwhelming. So I always wear uh, long sleeve black t-shirts. I have about, I don't know, six of these. And I wear long sleeve shirts, t-shirts because I get sneezing fits and I will literally sneeze 45 times in a row. The record is 75. I, 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 my, one of my friends in the 80s counted it. That's when it started in the late 80s. I would get a chill. I don't know if you know anyone who's ever done this. Off topic, I will get a chill and I will sneeze violently once or else I'll, most of the time it's 45, around 45 times and I'll almost lose my voice, which Shannon does not mind. So there you go. But Lou Graham, what a treat. What a, what a nice guy. We're going to revisit a lot. I think uh, tomorrow we're doing two tomorrow. One will be uh, Rick Emmett of Triumph. I think it'll be Rick. If if you want it to be Rick, just let just let me know and uh, we'll come on. How long have we been on here? Oh, an hour. And Fraser J was mentioning it's Friday Night Live. We used to come on, Shannon and I, every Friday night and basically do these things for you. But because of our lifestyle and our autistic daughter who is going through an awful lot right now and yelling through the house and she's running through the house yelling. And I don't mean to laugh, but there's a part of us that just has to smile about it because... It's, it's really, it's, it's Eric Carmen. That was one of those days she was having a really bad day and we couldn't calm her down. She's on medication that helps her not have seizures. It's amazing, but mood changes. It is, it is kooky. And all of a sudden she's fine. She'll completely stop and she'll, she'll be tired. She'll sleep really well that night. One night she was up till about two o'clock in the morning. And I, I, we were surprised that the, the neighbors never called the police going, are they killing someone over there? No, it's just her yelling, just rage. And that's, some people call it Kepra rage because of the medication she's on. And it just happens. So just wanted to get that off my chest because sometimes with, in our house, if someone dies, I can't, I can't, we can't take Danica out of the system. I have to be here and I can't come on. That's what happened with Eric Carmen. I planned to do it, ended up not doing it. It's too late to do it now. Everyone's covered it and that's fine. Ah, I feel much better now. Anyway, thank, uh, thanks everyone for coming on. I'm really sorry about the coughing, but I haven't done one of these. And for whatever reason, the software update I did with Ecamm must have taken out my setting, which has the microphone muted when a, when a video comes on. I found that out the hard way. One day we were on and I was reading while a, a BG thing was playing and I didn't realize my mic was was taken off. So long story. So um, I know that it's not a good thing to say happy Good Friday. I'm not going to say that. That's not appropriate. But I hope you have a good 
good Friday. I hope you have a good day today. Hope you have a good long weekend. And again, I'll try to do this twice tomorrow. One of the things that we didn't do uh, enough is getting on together, Shannon and I, but when Danica's here, we can't do it. We can't leave her alone. It's just like we have, to, she has to be with us. And if she would be here, if the coughing was bothering you, she does a lot of, she just does a lot of autistic, it's like kind of a stimming thing. So, um, oh, thank you, Fraser. Dwayne, happy Easter, everyone. Yeah, have a nice long weekend. We're a little below um, our quota this month. That's one of the reasons we're, because we were dealing with Danica so much, we, we thought, whoa, we've got to make some videos here. This is how we make our living. And I retired from radio. I was forced to retire, but I didn't mind retiring from Bell Media. They were really, really good to me. And after 41 years in radio and 30 years with them, I decided that, yeah, it's a good time. And they were very generous with me and it was a very good situation. So I'm no longer in radio after 41 years. That's it. A little short of 41 years, but we'll call it 41 because I think I, I've earned it a little bit. Didn't show on this broadcast that I've been in radio so many, because I mean, in the old days, just before I let you go, in the old days, what we would do when I went to my first radio station at CKRA in Edmonton, I've always worked major market, um, we would have three turntables. And I remember when I first got in, I'd say, why do we have three? You only need two. And Len Tucson, the guy who hired me said, oh, no, no, no. The last one is in case all hell breaks loose. If something's wrong and you forget to cue the next song, you know, you bring it backwards and the second you turn it on, those techniques, turntables, it would come on. He says, the last one and check it every few hours to make sure you didn't hit it and it, it's not queued up is if something goes wrong and if you do forget to cue or something goes wrong with the other turntables. So we'd have two turntables, two big Studer reel-to-reels over here, a great mixing board, a Neumann mic. It was just amazing to work at this major market radio station as my first uh, job. But back then we, we did a lot of multitasking and that's what radio was. And then it became automated in the way that I would look at a computer screen and all the music was there and I'd press the space bar to to start the next element or else a pot, you know, like a button on the, on the, on the mixer, but eventually it became very automated. And, uh, and I'm happy to have, uh, 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 given that up. Let's just say that. Anyway, thanks for being here. I'm going to try to come on noon mountain tomorrow with the third part of this, but with Danica, we never know what's going to happen. Unfortunately, I, I'd like to be consistent with sort of this stuff, but with 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 Dee, Dee as we call her, it, it's not uh, it's not always consistent because we have to take care of her, and she's a darling girl. But she's just going through some stuff. John Bowden, Rocky Street Music. The things we ask you: if you ever want to donate to the channel, there is a PayPal link at the very top of the description. You can join our Patreon. We're going to put some stuff on it tomorrow, some new stuff where you'll get early access to our videos. We have a newsletter now, which is great. Some people are saying they're not getting the newsletter. We've, we've sent out a few of them and, and we're not sure why it's not getting to everyone, but I've con contacted Constant Contact and said, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, and, you know, subscribe to the channel. Like our videos. We got a lot of likes on this one and uh, share them on social media. John Bowden, Rocky Street Music. Take care of yourself.